Well, it's four o'clock. Um, I'm Rick Wilson, the director of Ciencia, and I'd like to thank you for virtually attending today's lecture. This Zoom lecture is a first for Ciencia, and I hope to not be a continuation. Uh, what I'm gonna do is ask all of you to mute your sound and uh, turn off your screen, if you will. Uh, this uh, set of lectures will be recorded and we, we will be putting them up. Well, this year's lecture series is entitled Panoply, and I take the meaning to be a broad tapestry of talent. Uh, the aim of the series is to showcase the many different streams of research and ideas here at Rice. Ciencia members hope that this will encourage cross-school fertilization. Uh, and to that end, we have uh, three speakers today uh, who've each been instructed to take 10 to 12 minutes in their talk. At the end of all three talks, time will be given over to general questions from the audience. And uh, you're invited to ask your questions using the chat function anytime during uh, the course of the talks. And we'll turn to those at the end of all three presentations. Today's general topic is greening at home. And this seems appropriate given that tomorrow is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Uh, this series of mini lectures deal with the question what can you do to lower your carbon footprint? Well, rather than focus on global solutions, the speakers uh, will talk about what you can do here at Rice, on your commute, and at home. And uh, the three speakers have all tackled these quite, this particular question uh, from different perspectives. Uh, I'll introduce the speakers. Uh, turns out I'm the first speaker. I'm the hit, uh, Herbert S. Autry, uh, professor of Political Science, Statistics, and Psychology, and I've been here at Rice since 1983. Our second speaker is Lisa Lin, who's the Manager of Transportation Demand Management at Rice University. She's an avid bicyclist and spends a good deal, deal of her time figuring out how to limit the use of automobiles on the streets of Houston. Um, COVID-19, it turns out, has certainly changed her job in the short run. Uh, our third speaker is Richard Johnson. Richard is the Director of Administration Center for Sustainability and Energy Management. He's a professor in the practice of environmental studies and sociology and an adjunct professor, adjunct lecturer in civil and environmental engineering here at Rice. He also serves as the co-director of the Environmental Studies Program and is currently the president of the Rice University's Farmers Market. Well, uh, that being said, I'll go ahead and start the talks. And because I'm an academic, it's impossible for me to stick to only 10 minutes. Uh, so what I've done is invited my alter ego to present my talk. And uh, it's a means of ensuring that I don't go over in time. So if you bear with me as I shift my screen and share it with you, Behold the alter ego. I'm Rick Wilson, a social scientist in the Department of Political Science at Rice University. Not everyone gets a chance to build a house from scratch. My wife, Teresa, and I did so 11 years ago. At that time, green building was a new concept, and we liked everything about it. We decided to build a green home that would enable us to minimize our carbon footprint. While it's not possible for others to do exactly what we did, we learned a lot that might help others contemplating something similar. We started with some general sketches of what we wanted in a house and looked for an architect who had the skills and interest to work with us. I hadn't given much thought to a green architect, thinking it was too expensive, but Therese had. Eventually, we settled on a local architect, Laverne Williams, who had to start building straw bale houses. He took our rough ideas and immediately improved them. I was won over the idea of building a greenhouse, and as we became involved, I was happy to find out that building sustainably was not necessarily more costly. From the outset, we had a couple of principles in mind. Minimize the cost while using simple local materials where possible. 
and promote harmony between the indoors and the outdoors. After months of searching, we found two acres inside Houston city limits. What had formerly been pasture was now a 25-year-old mix of both native and invasive scrub and trees. We loved it. Our friends thought we were out of our minds. We had a vision that began with preserving as many trees as possible, so we carefully cut out a driveway and space for the footprint of the house. The trees that were removed were chipped on site and broadcast over parts of the property where they helped create the richest soil anywhere on the property. The foundation is very deep and rests on even deeper piers. The top surface of the foundation is our actual floor. The depth of the foundation helps mediate the temperature inside year-round. Now, all this concrete called for a cement bumper, which reaches over the top of the trees. The proportion of the cement in the mix was replaced with fly ash. Soil that was dug out for the foundation was used to build berms along the street to help reduce noise. As building got underway, we considered many alternatives for materials with a strong preference for local and simple. The exterior walls are framed with two by sixes, which allows for much more insulation, in this case, spray in isonine foam. Though the downstairs is relatively small at around 1,600 square feet, the north side of the house is almost 40 feet high. The second floor is a horseshoe-shaped balcony with just half a wall all around. This gives the house an extremely airy feel and helps tremendously with the cooling. The roof is supported by I-beams, which in turn are supported by beams bolted to the tops of steel poles embedded in the foundation. On the highest wall near the top are three large vents. As the day warms up, the hotter air rises to the ceiling. Late in the day, even in the summer, we can open the vents manually. The hot air streams out the vents, and when we open windows downstairs, we have a lovely breeze as the cooler air is pulled in. We also have a whole house stand. This operates on the same principle as the vents, pushing hot air out. While these were common in many Houston homes before central air, by opening windows in the ground floor, we can suck the air out of the house in 20 minutes by running the fan. Well, this is perfect on those still summer nights. The roof is standing seam galvanized steel that reflects light and has an optimal pitch for installing solar panels. These were too costly an investment when we built the house. The doors and windows use double pane glass to provide thermal and noise insulation. The exterior walls are made from locally produced cement board and provide substantial protection from the elements. A major part of what keeps the house comfortable is that it utilizes a passive solar design. In our case, this means no windows at all for the west side. Windows on the south side are small and have built-in eyebrows that shade them from the direct sunlight. The largest bank of windows upstairs and down face north and allow plenty of indirect light and a view of our little forest. The windows and large doors on the east side are shaded by elm, oak, and hackberry trees and also have eyebrows. For added structural support, there's a steel trellis covered with American wisteria, coral honeysuckle, and sweet autumn clematis. The vines provide additional protection from the sun during the summer mornings. The one problem we had with all these wonderful windows is that it's light. We tried UV stickers shaped like maple leaves. Well, they didn't work very well. We tried not washing the windows for years, which worked okay. Uh, birds fly into glass because the reflection of the surrounding trees looks like, well, trees to them. But the unwashed windows were unattractive. Eventually, we found a company that makes UV tape that you stick on glass for this very problem. We tried a couple of versions, but eventually settled on quarter-inch wide tape spaced about two inches apart. The effect is like jealousy windows, easy to see out of, attractive, and we've had zero bird strikes in the years since applying them. And, better, we can wash our windows again. We decided early on to do most of our own interior work partly because we thought we'd enjoy it and partly because it's much cheaper than paying others to do it. We found a local source for formaldehyde-free plywood and we were off. While there's a bit of a learning curve, we both got to be pretty good carpenters. We painted the inside and the outside of the house and learned a lot about scaffolding. Of course, none of this happened overnight. We've spent many years working on the house and believe in our motto. Being involved in the building was a wonderful experience and gave us a lifetime supply of stories. For example, the staircase was rebuilt twice due to city code problems. We saved all the removed stair treads and I turned them into a top of a major workbench. Everyone thought that the cement foundation would be just a second floor to be covered up, but no, we wanted it as our main floor downstairs. 
At the time, it was too expensive to have it polished, but once we acid stained it black, it looked great. Upstairs, we had tongue and groove two by six East Texas yellow pine for flooring. We sanded it down and then coated it with a 50-50 mix of tongue oil and orange oil, both natural. The house smelled like oranges for weeks, but the floor is tough, the lumber is local, and it's aged beautifully. For the first five years living in the house, we almost never used air conditioning. We spent a good deal of time trying to figure out how to live most comfortably with this house. Later, we invested in solar panels. The price dropped and we ended up with a system of 30 panels that's enough to provide about 80% of our electrical usage. We now run both air conditioning and heating over the course of the year, but there are many months when we never use either. Building the house was only part of our goal. We wanted to manage the mini forest for birds and other local fauna. The main problems were thousands of Chinese tallow trees, thousands of Chinese glossy leaf privet, and Japanese privet. These three were so thick in some places that much of the property had nothing at all growing on the ground and there were next to no birds. Well, we've made huge strides and learned a lot about forestry along the way. Most of the huge old tallow trees are either gone or standing dead snags that we leave for woodpeckers and flickers. Uh, we're a regular stop for migratory birds and have a good-sized population of locals, mainly blue jays, cardinals, doves, mockingbirds, and various hawks. We also hear lots of birds we never see, so we can't identify. We focused on keeping water on our property. Our driveway was built with urbanite, crushed concrete. This meant the drive was permeable. We also bought and installed a 5,000 and a 3,000 gallon cistern to collect rainwater off the roof. That water is used for gardening and filling a pond. We, we built a smallish pond with the idea that if you build it, they will come. It's now a major hub for wildlife throughout the property. Now that we have plenty of water, we added a vegetable garden. This was not built all at once, but we gradually figured out the best siting, the best approach to building beds, and integrating the water system. We did introduce some non-natives into the property, chickens. They're wonderful for keeping the ground stirred up, keeping the insect population down, and eating whatever starts growing out of the ground. Their coop is designed not so much to keep the chickens in, but to keep everyone else out. These days we have a full complement of raccoon, possums, hawks, and coyotes. Everyone loves chicken. Finally, we've made huge progress eliminating the invasives. All that glossy leaf privet, including the stuff that makes up the hedges around rice, gets pulled up. Tallow trees were dominant at the outset, but we banded many of them, they die, we fell them, cut them up, and then stacked them. This has created a lot of critter hotels, of mice, snakes, rabbits, toads, frogs, and lizards. Uh, the stack logs are full of nursery holes made by various invertebrates. All in all, we're seeing life come back to the property. It turns out that building green involves more than just a house. It means attention to your surroundings as well. With informed planning, it's not so hard, nor is it expensive. But as with everything wonderful, it takes time. Right, made it in under 10 minutes. It's a miracle. Uh, now I'd like to have, uh, turn it over to Lisa Lynn. Lisa. Great, can you hear me okay? All right, can everyone see my screen? Okay, great, thank you so much, Rick. And actually, um, I toured your house years ago when the city had the green building tour, so great to see that you made a lot of <laughs> uh, additional improvements to it. So um, as Rick said, I am Lisa Lynn. I'm the Transportation Demand Management Manager uh, at Rice University. And today we'll kind of discuss uh, my attempt for near zero emissions commuting in Houston. So just a little bit about me, uh, for those I haven't met before, my background is in architecture, the keen interest on green building. Um, so I've done a lot of work with the local USGBC chapter here, um, which really helped me kind of change career paths into the sustainability uh, field. So have served as the sustainability manager for the cities of Houston uh, and climate program manager for the city of uh, San Antonio. So I've had some experience with the municipal sustainability realm. Um, and currently, I'm actually pursuing a part-time master's of science with, um, uh, at 
Oxford University in the UK around sustainable urban development. So I feel like a lot of these life experiences have helped inform how I approach promoting sustainable transportation at Rice University. So what is transportation de de demand management or TDM? It's kind of a mouthful. Basically, all it is is really promoting sustainable transportation options. How do people commute to and from work, uh, to and from campus, to and from school um, in a smart manner? So of course, we, we live in a very uh, car-centric city in Houston. We've been actually collecting data over the last couple of years around commuting behaviors here at Rice. And so what we found since 2017 that our employees still use their uh, vehicles predominantly to get to campus. So for our employees, about 77% drive alone to Rice. Um, our off-campus students, uh, meaning our off-campus undergraduate students and our graduate students, actually have done a really great job of adopting other types of transportation behaviors. So uh, for our off-campus undergraduate students, around 47% now drive alone. Um, when we started, it was around 57%, so we've seen a good drop for under, uh, undergraduate off-campus students. Our graduate students, when we started off in 2017 with our commuter survey, it was around 56%. Now it's dropped down to 52%. So again, a lot of our focus areas really look at how do we help employees figure out how not to drive alone to Rice. And with that survey, we've actually looked at, um, you know, reasons why people try uh, drive alone to, to Rice. So oftentimes it's, you know, it's a time commitment to try to switch and learn how to use a different transportation uh, mode. Sometimes it might take longer, um, but sometimes you can utilize that time better if you're not actually having to be uh, behind the wheel. We also understand that, you know, there are family commitments which make, uh, make it hard to switch to carpooling or, or riding the bus. So, you know, folks might need to pick up kids, they might have to take care of a, a sick parent. Um, so there are pools that, that make it challenging to switch to another mode. Um, there are also, you know, financial um, challenges, you know, potentially if you drive alone all the time, that's wear and tear on your car. It costs money to obviously fuel up and pay for parking and tolls. Um, so, you know, that it, what I try to convey is, you know, really look at the total cost of your commute. You know, it doesn't make sense for you to switch over and save some money at the end. And obviously, um, environmental impacts you know, with, with the, uh, you know, congestion and air pollution issues that we have, obviously switching to another mode uh, would definitely help uh, our environmental situation. So what I do at RISE is basically look at all the different modes that are available to us. Uh, we do have you know, folks who live close enough who can walk and bike. Um, we do have folks who you know, use transportation options that Metro offers. Uh, folks who use the Fort Bend Transit uh, Park and Ride or the Woodlands Express, even the Conroe uh, Park and Ride. So lots of different transit options and um, really trying to figure out how best to really promote those uh, options for folks. Then looking at carpooling and van pooling, um, you know, there are things that we can do on our end to help promote these uh, mode shifts to, to those to those two types of many options. Um, sometimes, you know, some universities have actually incentivized this type of behavior change to, uh, you know, helping split the cost for driving or paying uh, paying folks to not drive to campus at all. So, lots of different options for us to explore in the future um, when it's not possible to switch to driving, uh, to, to carpooling or taking the bus. We also promote uh, adopting electric vehicles uh, if possible. We do have some charging stations on campus. Uh, we have 10 charging ports at the entrance three garage, and then we have a brand new station at North Lot, which is completely solar powered, uh, which could charge two vehicles. So really exciting um, kind of advances on campus in terms of uh, electric vehicle charging. And obviously something that we're all very used to right now is um, the teleworking um, kind of concept. So again, we don't have a formal policy, but uh, we were thinking after this experience, there could be some way to adopt some kind of uh, formal teleworking policy in the future for our employees. So just a little bit about my personal commuting stories. I think oftentimes when it comes to changing behavior, um, you, you kind of need some commute champions to help you uh, encourage adopting those uh, new ways of getting to and work. So when I started at Rice in January 2017, um, my husband and I actually 
decided to live uh, closer to where we work. So he works in the medical center. And so we actually opted for an apartment complex right east of Herman Park. At that time, I, uh, I was officing at the BRC. So looking at that commute distance, biking actually made the most sense for me uh, with a two mile uh, bike ride, not too bad in the mornings and evenings. So we did that. Um, until we actually moved offices to the new Cambridge office building in October of 2017. So that move, we actually, my commute actually got uh, a little bit shorter, so got, um, became one and a half miles. So still decided to bike, um, and it was actually a lot faster bike ride. So in terms of health benefits, didn't really reap that much um, in terms of cardiovascular activity because it was such a short bike ride. Uh, and then 2018 uh, in October, we actually moved apartments right across from where we were living across the cul-de-sac there. And so still had that one and a half mile commute. But then I was thinking, well, um, since I'm trying to also promote other modes, including walking, I should try walking myself. So decided to embark on uh, this one and a half mile commute by foot, uh, which took about 30 minutes or so. So a little bit more um, benefits on the, on the health side. Then later on, we decided to look for houses. Um, when we initially looked at um, places around town, we were really focusing on places that were accessible by um, either the light rail, by uh, a bus route potentially, uh, a bike um, you know, that was near bike lanes or bike facilities that could help us connect to work. So we ended up finding a place actually in the near north side, which is right north of downtown and um, relatively close to one of the transit stops, uh, which is um, uh, pretty convenient because then we could just hop onto the red line and, and get to campus. So that it was about a six mile commute. In the beginning, I was actually biking uh, to the light rail station and then bringing my, and then actually locking the bike at the transit station and then uh, taking the light rail in. After a few incidents of um, things being stolen off my bike, I decided to actually bring my bike onto the light rail and bring it to work. So there were times where I felt adventurous and <laughs> decided to actually bike home, uh, opted for a more um, kind of, you know, lower traffic um, route. So we'd go up Woodhead and, kind of connect via the uh, Buffalo Bayou trails and get home. So that was about an eight mile commute. So about 45 minutes or so. Then my husband actually switched roles um, at, uh, at Methodist. And so we decided to carpool. I hadn't, I hadn't explored that mode yet. So that was kind of a, a new thing for me to kind of see how, how that would work um, commuting with a spouse. We actually, um, own of an electric vehicle. So we were thinking, oh, well, maybe it's actually not too bad because it's an electric vehicle and we're carpool. Um, but as we were thinking about that, we actually also installed solar panels on our house when we, um, probably a few months after we bought it because we joined a, a solar co-op called Solar United Neighbors. So we were actually able to um, get really good pricing on the, on the panels. And with that um, installation, we, we were able to acquire 15 minute interval data that really showed what our consumption patterns um, in the production of our solar panels look like. So it was actually the, this, um, this chart in particular that kind of opened our eyes to, well, even though we're carpooling our electric vehicle, this, this drawn power at home really um, kind of negated our our desire to actually offset 98% of our electricity. So it's actually pulling a little bit more than we were expecting. Um, so if you look uh, at the, the nighttime charging, um, basically where that, uh, where I plugged in when I got home one night, um, it was a big, a big pull. And so I was like, well, maybe we shouldn't be driving as much. So that basically helped us uh, change our behavior back to taking the light rail. Um, so this is current, well, not currently, but this is what we were doing before, um, things kind of changed here in Houston. Um, so hopefully once things kind of go back to normal, we'll be going back to the light rail. Um, but I will say that one of the interesting things, especially when you're designing your commute, um, and you're not choosing, uh, to use your own vehicle 
is that first last mile connection. So as I mentioned before, our house is a little bit, um, you know, not quite walking distance, but I have walked it. Um, it's a little under a mile to get to the transit station. So I've tried walking, I've tried biking. Uh, we were basically carpooling to that stop, which is again, less than a mile, uh, and then taking the rail in. So I think this, the, the main takeaway is, Oftentimes when you're um, kind of hitting a, a different milestone in your life, you know, changing jobs, changing uh, residents, uh, those are the best times to really look at different commuting behaviors that you might adopt. Um, and because everything uh, you know, has, has been changed at that point, so you may as well look at ways to get around Houston without using your car. And that's it. Thank you very much, Lisa. I'm gonna switch now to Richard. Great, thank you. Um, I share my screen. Okay, can y'all see this? I'm assuming that's a yes. Okay, so um, hi everyone. My name is Richard Johnson. I'm the Sustainability Director at Rice. Uh, Lisa, happy recent birthday, by the way. Um, so uh, it's an honor to be part of the Scientia um, uh, series. I think this is one of the most important uh, series of talks that um, uh, have been part of Rice and part of Rice's culture in the 16 years that I've been here. So I'm, I'm just really pleased uh, to have been invited. Um, today, I want to share with you what I believe is one of the most distinctive features of Rice's sustainability efforts, as well as one of the most distinctive aspects of our environmental curriculum. And that is that the two are very closely linked. At Rice, we equip our students to be future environmental leaders by enabling them to enact change on the campus through their coursework. So you'll see that I've used some jargon in the title of the presentation to describe this, Rice Living Lab. So what do we mean by that? A campus living lab in this context means that you use the physical campus itself, the operations of the campus, and the behaviors of the people on the campus as the focus for class projects. And the goal is to improve the environmental performance of the campus while using the experience um, as a way of meeting the learning objectives for the class. It's experiential environmental education. We have a long history of doing this at Rice, longer than most universities, going back at least to the 1997-1998 academic year. So what I intend to do over the next 10 minutes is to share with you a series of examples of how this Rice Living Lab concept um, uh, looks in action. And I'll begin with the, the class that has been doing it for the longest. Um, in, in fact, my position was created in part by the activities of this class. And now as fate would have it, I, um, I teach the class. So that class is called um, Environmental Issues Rice into the Future. It's cross-listed between sociology and environmental studies. And I'll use this particular class to talk about a waste reduction project. So um, those of you of a certain age will recognize this as the character Bluto from the movie Animal House as played by the late great John Belushi. And what I wanna draw your attention to is what was essentially the problem statement for a waste reduction project. That when you provide trays in an all-you-can-eat cafeteria, some people will take all the food that they can pile onto their trays regardless of their appetite, eat some of it, throw the rest away, and in the case of Animal House, start a food fight with it. Um, so in 2008, a project team from my class was, was tasked by Mark Dittman from Housing and Dining with um, testing the hypothesis that removing trays from the dining halls would reduce food waste. They set up an experiment at the South Servery during lunches where they removed the trays, which required people to carry their own plates. Now, working closely with housing and dining staff, they measured food waste across a series of testing control cases and found that when you remove the trays, they realized a one-third reduction in food waste. Further, the kitchen staff reported um, about a 10% reduction in use of the dishwasher, and so that saves energy and water and detergents. But here's where the savings really kicks in. If the students are taking less food, then the dining staff 
don't have to cook as much food, nor do they have to buy as much food. So after sharing these results with, the, uh, with Rice's college presidents, because we do believe in stakeholder engagement, um, those student leaders endorsed the idea of Rice making uh, the switch to trayless dining across all the kitchens. So it's now the standard uh, across Rice today. Of course, the college presidents were clever. They said, you can't just pocket that money and use it elsewhere. We want you to roll that into um, having um, better quality food. And of course, the food at Rice is outstanding. So as a second example, um, I want to share an energy project with you. Now, five years ago, a group uh, from the Ken Kennedy Institute reached out to us and said that they were creating a graduate level class that was going to be cross-listed between the School of Engineering and the business school. Um, and they were looking for big data sets to use as part of a class project. Now, as it just so happens, we have tons of machine generated data related to our utility plants, but we didn't quite know how a class could use this or what they would do with it. So what put, it, put us at ease was, when, um, was a key insight from Jan Odegaard. And he said to us, if you bring two different data sets together and you put students in a discovery mode, you may get explosive results. Now, we didn't, I mean, we were gonna be working with utility plants, so we didn't want it to be literally explosive, but, uh, but you get the idea. So um, the problem statement that emerged came from the realization that in trying to explain the data sets to the students and the course instructor, we kept emphasizing the complexity of the decision-making environment of the plant operators. Uh, there are many pieces of equipment to operate. Each have their own performance characteristics. There are external variables like price, and weather, and time of day that you have to consider as well. Plus there are human factors too. Each plant operator seem to have their own operating style when they operate the plant. Each has their own um, tolerance of risk. So what we distilled in, uh, is the following uh, problem statement. At any given time, what equipment should the plant operators run in order to meet the campus energy needs as cheaply as possible? So now I need to point out that while these were technically sophisticated graduate students, they started without any prior knowledge of how a utility plant operates. So uh, several members of the facilities team regularly attended the classes, including Mark Gardner from my staff, as well as our plant operator, Hugh Tontat. And uh, Hugh led the students on a tour of the plants, and they coached the students along the way, answered questions about how the plant functions, about how we procure energy. And so by the end of the semester, what resulted from the project was essentially a plant optimization scheme, a new strategy for how we operate the plants. And so when the plant director implemented it, and I think, let me underline, he thought it was good enough that he said, let's give this a try. He was amazed by the savings. As was reported later in an article in the Rice News, we were seeing a reduction in energy use of about $15,000 per month. Um, so this is, this is carbon reduction at scale. This, um, uh, you know, this shaved a few percentage points off of our carbon footprint. So thanks to working with the class, we achieved fantastic energy savings, and all it cost us was our time and a few pizzas. So it was well worth it. So um, as, as the final example, let's talk about a project that is currently underway. Um, as some of you might know, our entire campus is designated as the Lynn R. Lowry Arboretum at Rice University. An arboretum is a collection of trees and woody plants. And part of the mission of Rice's Arboretum is in fact to treat the campus landscape as a living lab. A few years ago, the Arboretum Committee had planned to plant more trees in our detention uh, basin by Weiss College, which is an area that we call the Harris Gully Natural Area. The reason it has that name is that there used to be a gully that flowed across this area and actually across campus. Um, it's still there, but it's, uh, but it's underground, but that's, that's, a, that's a whole nother story. So um, a faculty member named Cassidy Johnson was teaching the conservation biology class, and she happened to ask to see if the Arbore what the Arboretum Committee's plans for that area were and if we could share them with her. Um, so we sent them to her. And um, a week or two later, she requested that she and her students be able to come speak to the Arboretum Committee at one of our meetings. And um, so we invited them and they made the pitch 
to, to the committee that instead of planting more trees, we should install a prairie. So what we learned from Dr. Johnson and from her students was that the coastal prairie ecosystem was once the dominant ecosystem along the Texas coast, as well as in, as in Southwest Louisiana. It covered uh, 9 million acres. And the coastal prairie ecosystem was the primary ecosystem in Harris County as well, including where, um, where rice was built. But today, less than 1% of that coastal prairie remains. And what does remain is highly fragmented and is under pressure to be developed. But why is this ecosystem so important? So let's have a look at the um, underground, at the root system of prairie plants. You'll see that some of these have root systems that extend up to 15 feet below the ground, which helps to absorb water. Now on the far left side of the screen, you see the typical suburban grass. Um, you see uh, you know, on any um, residential lawn, that's not a prairie grass and those roots just go a few inches deep. Well, prairies act like sponges and the prairie grasses make the ground more porous. So they basically plant the rain. Um, typical suburban lawns, of course, do not. So as we in the Houston area well know, anything that helps to reduce flooding is very important. As Houston continues to sprawl to the west and to the northwest, we're losing what's left of these natural sponges and replacing them with subdivisions and shopping centers and freeways and parking lots, and all of this makes flooding worse. Um, prairies, in addition to helping to reduce flooding, also sequester carbon. Prair prairies can store more carbon below ground in the soil than many forests can store above ground in their biomass. So this helps in the fight against global warming. You often hear people say that um, as part of the climate solution that we should plant more trees. Well, we should also be planting prairies. So Dr. Johnson and her students convinced the Arboretum Committee to convert the Harris Gully Natural Area into an urban pocket prairie restoration project as a demonstration for how Houston can restore this vital prairie ecosystem service um, in an urban space. So the Arboretum Committee tasked the class with uh, developing a planting uh, plan for the prairie and also conducting a series of studies to better understand the site's ecology. And what we see here is just a general schematic showing a phased approach to the project and what they have, you know, at a high level, what they plan to do in different areas of the Harris Gully Natural Area. Now in 2018, on the last day of class, the students and a group of um, community volunteers and rice volunteers launched the Prairie Restoration Project. And uh, this is Rebecca Bryant. She was one of the students in the class. After the class ended, we funded an internship for her to continue working on the prairie and to help to maintain it along with Dr. Johnson and, uh, and with our grounds team as well. And after she graduated, um, based on her hands-on experience at Rice, she was hired to work at a prairie reserve as part of a University of Minnesota field station. And as I understand it, has since been accepted into graduate school program specializes in prairie restorations. So the work of the Harris Gully Natural Area is ongoing. We continue to engage with Dr. Johnson's class uh, to use this campus landscape as the focus of their conservation biology work. So you're going to be seeing a lot more in the next year or so to come. So these are just a handful of examples of our Rice Living Lab program, where we've engaged students in the classroom to help lead Rice to a more sustainable future. And perhaps more importantly, through this concept, we've given students hands-on experience that they need to be effective as environmental leaders and problem solvers after they graduate, regardless of what discipline they're in and regardless of what career trajectory that they are choosing. So why does this Rice Living Lab concept work? Um, at a high level, I believe it's because we are connecting instruction with real problems that motivate students and then giving them hands-on opportunities to enact change. So I like to refer to this as the synthesis of hearts, minds, and hands. For those of you who want to learn more about how this works, 
I encourage you to check out a chapter that I co-authored with Elizabeth Long, uh, who I um, taught, uh, co-taught the uh, class with for many years, um, about lessons learned from our experiences at Rice um, through the class. It appears in the book Teaching Sustainability on Stephen F. Uh, Austin State University Press. If you email me, I'd be happy to um, send you a copy of the chapter. Um, I'm also sharing with you a variety of ways that you can connect with us. If you're interested in exploring ways to support and strengthen the Rice Living Lab program, please reach out to me. Um, I want to end by uh, saying thank you to the students at Rice. I'm really proud to be able to speak about their work and I'm grateful that they advocated for my position to be created in the first place. Serving with them and working with them and um, and uh, being part of this Rice Living Lab program has brought me great joy over the years. So thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, I've uh, asked everyone if you have questions for us, uh, please uh, ask them via chat. We have a lively discussion going on right now. I've been perusing it. I'll take uh, sort of the first question. Uh, it's kind of a combination question from Moshe Vardy and uh, Mahmoud El Gamal, who basically say, look, you know, Rick, you know, greening at home, it's no big deal. I mean, it only distracts us from the larger global problems of climate change. And I think that's probably a fair point, but providing exemplars of what can be done uh, by those who can, are, are so inclined, uh, points us in directions that we might not otherwise have um, considered. Uh, I had no interest in uh, building a green home or anything that was sustainable uh, when we started. But when I discovered that it was not that expensive, it didn't add that much more to the cost, and it could be an exemplar, and we were developing new techniques and materials, hey, why not? Uh, it seemed like a, a reasonable thing to do. Uh, are there things that we could do better than, you know, investing in building a greenhouse? Well, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, uh, all the energy that I produce on my panels gets wiped out every time I take an airplane trip in terms of my carbon footprint. Uh, so, you know, one, one fewer flight would, would do it. Two fewer flights would be even better. Uh, so if you're looking for things that one can do uh, to, to have an effect, that's, that's one thing. But I take both uh, Moshe and, and Mahmoud's comments to heart. I mean, is this, uh, in economics, there's this idea of comparative advantage. And if I squandered my comparative advantage by investing all my time in the house, I, I'd say no. I'm actually getting some consumption value out of, out of uh, living where I do. So I'll stop there. Uh, there are a series of questions. Uh, so to, to Richard and to Lisa, um, Jim Pomerantz asks, how, how, does, uh, how do you guys feel about purchasing solar, wind or, uh, purchasing solar power or wind power off the grid as opposed, as opposed to installing your own panels and so forth? Um, I'll throw from, a campus, from a campus level, um, so I, I co-taught a, a course with um, Kyriakos Zigarakis for a number of years in chemical engineering. And um, we had students do a calculation um, to see how much of Rice's electricity needs could be met by uh, putting solar on, um, on all the rooftops where it made sense on the campus, as well as putting solar structures out in the um, parking lots. And I want to say that we reached about 10 or 15% of total campus usage. So even if we completely solared up the Rice campus, uh, you know, that doesn't move the needle in the way that um, a big off-site utility scale project would. Um, plus those types of um, projects, uh, you really get to take advantage of the economics of scale. Um, so, um, uh, you know, that leaves you with having to, um, uh, purchase from the grid. Uh, Lisa? 
Yeah, I mean, I think for, for us, uh, we probably would not have um, installed solar on our house had it not been for that co-op program. Um, financially, it just made sense for us because it was a competitive effort, um, competitive bid between different solar installers to really kind of um, fight for this group of uh, homeowners who were interested in installing solar. So we actually got it at a really low price and with the 30% tax credit um, and a rebate back from CenterPoint. So uh, with, with that kind of in the calculus, we just couldn't say no. Before this, we were actually purchasing um, uh, through MP2 Energy's uh, plan uh, a solar farm out in kind of like west side of Houston in Sealy. So I think do what you can and what you're comfortable with. I think it all, it all makes sense. And uh, we, we do have um, some on-campus solar. In fact, um, it was a calculation from that same class that showed us that the payback was um, a lot better than we thought it would be for campus installation, just based on the way that we purchase our electricity. Um, and uh, we had a, a friendly client in, in Mark Dittman. And so now between the north and south wings of Jones College, we have 100 kilowatts of uh, solar on campus. Um, we've got more coming with the upcoming um, Sid Rich College project. Um, I'd like to get us up to between one and two megawatts of on-campus solar. I think that's our, our right level. Uh, Lisa, Jim Tucker asked, uh, how do you communicate the economics of uh, the cost of transportation to different people? Do you break it down by uh, cents per mile or, or you know, how do you, how do you put everything on an equivalent basis? That's a great question. And, and we haven't really done that across the board necessarily. Um, oftentimes when we bring in representatives, uh, for example, from Vanpool, um, they actually do those cost calculations because it really does matter, you know, to what mode you're switching, um, for that those economics to kind of uh, shake out. So we we have some numbers for for Vanpool because it does uh, actually cost to participate also. So every now and then it might not be kind of a, uh, completely offset the cost of driving alone, but there are other benefits other than economics that we really try to promote also. So it could be um, you know uh, just for your own kind of well-being, not having to be stuck behind a wheel and driving yourself in, in congestion. There are some uh, benefits with that. But I think the other thing is also looking at, you know, when you're changing modes, it has to be easy just because it might save you money. Um, if it's not easy, people aren't going to switch. And if it's not something that, um, that you know that other colleagues are doing, that's also challenging too. Um, oftentimes, you need it to be more of like a social change in order for folks to really adopt that. Great. Randy John asked if there is a publicly available software which provides uh, a user a way to evaluate options when renovating or, or building homes. That is, how do you do the trade-offs between solar electricity versus LED lighting, types of cooling and heating systems. And yeah, I'm not familiar right now of, the pub, uh, of, of such software, but I do think it's widely available. Does anybody else, Richard, do you know anything about such a thing? Um, so suppose I wanna renovate my house, I'm retrofitting, can I quickly calculate out uh, the costs and, and make an assessment of whether it's worthwhile? Well, just for a portion of that, um, there's uh, a very easy to use um, uh, software through, uh, uh, Lisa, is it NREL that where you can model a solar array for your rooftop? Uh, PV uh, Watts, uh, PVWATT, maybe may have an S on it or not. Um, LED, uh, we're at the point where you just ought to do it um, if you're talking about new fixtures. Um, but as to some of the more sophisticated trade offs, that gets into some energy modeling. So um, there's probably some good residential um, uh, home energy modeling software. Lisa, do you know? Uh, when I used to work at the architecture firm, we used to use a program called ResCheck that we actually yeah. had to fill out to submit uh, to the city for permitting. I can't remember if that was free, but um, it, it's a pretty basic 
a program like ComCheck, ResCheck, you can put in basic um, inputs to help spit out, you know, the difference in changing insulation or um, uh, R value in your walls and whatnot. So. So I think this one's also for Lisa uh, from Pat Dwyer. Uh, he says it'll be interesting to understand a further progression of your commute analysis and compare your energy consumption footprint in the current uh, working from home mode. I think this is true for all of us. And whether a working from home mode some days or all days of the week can realize pretty huge environmental advantages, at least for Rice and other uh, businesses around Houston. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to kind of dig into that data, um, given that we, I do have access to our consumption here at home. Um, and and would be interesting to kind of compare that to someone who actually drives alone every day. Um, perhaps that's where you see the biggest benefit of that. This is not how we wanted to cut our carbon footprint, by the way. I just <laughs> want to make that clear. <laughs> Well, Jordan Metz just asked, uh, does this stay at home uh, order pre prevent, present an opportunity for uh, better planning of better bike lanes and public transportation infrastructure? Um, I think implicit in the question is whether or not um, this stay at home order is going to result in uh, some marked behavioral changes over time. Bill Fulton of the Kinder Institute has had some very interesting um, blog posts recently about how uh, this experience might change how we approach um, uh, uh, design of cities, including um, uh, it's drawing attention to the need for park space and, and sidewalks and those sorts of things. So uh, Jordan, I would uh, certainly encourage you to check out uh, um, the Kinder Institute website for that. And I just want to take this moment to promote um, that we will be doing Rice Bike Month activities still. It won't be um, as, as we've held in the past, uh, obviously not in, in person events, but we will be having a presentation from both uh, traffic engineers and the Houston Parks Board about different um, bike infrastructure projects that are coming online in Houston, uh, both on street and off street. So I would stay tuned for that um, presentation when, it comes, when I when, uh, start promoting. Okay, any last thoughts, panelists or speaker, fellow speakers? If not, I want to thank both of you for providing, uh, for joining in on this and providing some really thoughtful uh, talks. Um, I want to let everybody know uh, that this has been recorded. Uh, it will be posted probably sometime in the next week or so at uh, Ciencia's website. And if Michelle could put our Ciencia uh, splash page back up, everybody can take a look and see where it's going to be uh, located. So if you go to uh, our Ciencia uh, website, uh, within a week, hopefully you'll be able to find the recording of this. Again, thank you, everybody. I wish that we could have adjourned to the reception outside of McMurtry, but hey, not in the cards, but I think this went pretty well. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you. And happy Earth Day. <laughs> yes, happy, happy Earth, Earth Day. Day tomorrow. <laughs>